Technical Community College, STCC. Uh, welcome, everyone. Hello, my name is Sandra Perone. I am an associate professor teaching photography, philosophy, and honors seminar courses at STIC. I'm also gallery coordinator of the Amy H. Carberry Fine Arts Gallery, located in Building 28. The Carberry Gallery exhibitions are intended to foster intellectual engagement and dialogue beyond the traditional classroom. This learning environment serves to break preconceived notions of a gallery as an exclusive space, ideas of who artists and photographers are and what they create, and to inspire students to pursue their own creative endeavors and career goals. At STIC, fine arts courses are open to everyone, and the importance of visual literacy to every student's overall education ed educational experience cannot be understated, no matter their major. One of the primary objectives of the gallery is to bring to campus a wide range of media, ideas, artistic practices, which expose students to an array of creative and intellectual work. So here we are, due to COVID, operating virtually because we can and should remain safe. And this is the third talk in a series of virtual interviews this semester called Carberry Conversations between myself and artists who have exhibited at the Carberry Gallery since 2013. This was conceived in response to the ongoing pandemic uh, and these conversations function as a kind of retrospective while also connecting working artists to the greater Springfield community covering a wide variety of topics, including origin stories, impact of current events on artistic practice, and the function of art and photography during times of crisis. I am delighted to have a conversation with visual artist and retired professor of art at Westfield State University, Keith Hollingworth. His work is the first exhibit to reopen the gallery uh, space to in-person visits during this time of COVID. And I thank Keith for, for being flexible and making himself available and bringing 40 Black writers to campus. His show will be on view through December 7th. Keith uh, graduated from the Rhode Island School of Design in uh, 1959. Uh, he served in the US Army for two years and attended Mills College in Oakland, California, receiving, receiving his MFA in 1964. He taught in Ohio for a year and later uh, was on, in the art department at UMass at Amherst. In 1967, he moved to New York to establish himself as an artist and exhibited at the Paula Cooper Gallery. Uh, in 1974, he moved to New York City, uh, or moved from New York City uh, to Western Massachusetts and began teaching as an adjunct at HCC, GCC, uh, Mount Wachusett Community College and Westfield State University. He eventually became tenured at WS, WSU and retired in 2019. He is a founding member of the Gallery A3, a cooperative gallery located in Amherst. And I first met Keith in 2016. Uh, he exhibited at the Carberry Gallery in October of 2017 with two series that we're gonna talk about today, uh, 54 African Americans and homage to art. Uh, and one last housekeeping note, if anyone uh, who's on the live stream today has any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat feature and we'll try to get to them. I also want to thank everyone at the Center for Online and Digital Learning for spearheading um, the inclusivity in instruction and helping develop classroom activities related to gallery exhibits and talks. Um, so faculty interested in incorporating any of Keith's artwork into a classroom activity um, can just search CODL on the STIC website for details. And a big thank you to everyone at the STIC library for amassing 35 books on display related to Keith's exhibition, 40 Black Writers. So welcome, Keith, and thank you so much uh, for being here uh, and sharing your work. Uh, nice to see you, as always, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should start uh, uh, with, with uh, an origin question, um, which is, what is uh, one of your first memories of seeing art or an artist in your life? Um, when I was in high school, one day I had to go to the principal's office and uh, I don't remember why. Um, I don't think I was being disciplined. I mean, I think it was, I had to show up with some paperwork or something, you know, mm -hmm. of course. And um, on the wall was this painting. It was a landscape, very realistic. And 
it had a large expanse of sky. And there was this, the way it was painted, it really brought this sense of light hitting the cloud and passing through. I mean, it, it was really, um, I could never have said it at the time, but now in hindsight, it was the, the painting, that, the, the, the vision of the landscape and whatnot, it, you know, it almost had like a spiritual quality to it. Mm. And I've never been able to forget that image, you know, and it was, but combined with that is like, how did that person do that? Mm -hmm. You know, how how did they how do they, you know, how how do they make an image like that? So, um, so that that's that's been ongoing. Like, you know, how do people make the images that they do? How do they conjure them up, and produce them, and bring them forth into the world? And so I've been doing it. You know, I've been doing it ever since. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so when you decided to go, so you see this painting, you have this, uh, it sounds like a moment where you were a wow factor, right? Like how does somebody make this, right? And you want, you decide you want to be one of those people to make art, right? Um, so did you take a lot of art classes, uh, you know, in high school? Like, how do you decide to go to RISD? Uh, you know, Rhode Island School of Design is a, is a big art school? What what was sort of your progression from the wow moment to sort of making that commitment to training as an artist? Well, shortly after that first engagement, okay. Um, first of all, I, I was I was born and raised in Rhode Island. Okay. So I, um, and uh, at, at the time, I was, my family, we were living in Cranston, Rhode Island. And um, Anyway, so I think it was like when I, it was sort of foregone conclusion in my family that I would go to college. What I was going to major in, I had no idea and whatnot. And um, I think it was my junior in high school and everybody took this, um, I don't know what they called it, avocation test or whatnot, you know? And I said, I'd like to joke it, there is, you know, what are your interests, you know, in, in terms of, you know, what you might pursue. And um, at one time I had been interested in possibly becoming a veterinarian. And um, so I, uh, so the result was that it said that my two major interests were either farming or art. <laughs> and um, I couldn't see myself as a farmer. So that was it, you know, I mean, I just, art, that's, yeah, I, I like that idea. I like to pursue it and whatnot. And so um, I, I obviously I was taking courses, art courses at, in high school, which at that point, I mean, this is the 50s, you know, so there wasn't like a lot the way it is today. And, and, um, and I would go to the local library and the art and music section was in the, uh, lower level. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just started taking out books of, mm -hmm. of, of art, take them home and just look at them. And um, so and at that, that point in time, what drew my interest a lot were the impressionists, you know, I, and, and, and so, you know, I'm there, I mean, I live in Rhode Island, so I applied to RISD and fortunately got in. Yeah, yeah. What was it like at RISD in the late 50s, early 60s? Well, well, I graduated in 59, so I wasn't into the 60s yet, but, <laughs> but uh, um, I mean, for me, it was just wonderful mm -hmm. because I, I loved, I loved just doing it all, okay? And the idea that you could get up in the morning and go in and work in a studio all day long and then go home or, or have you know some kind of a dinner and then go and then go back to the studio work all night you know i mean it was just you know it's like you never wanted it to end mm -hmm. you know after four years you know because you know um unlike going to a um, 
you know, uh, like for instance, taking, like for as you know, I taught at Westfield State University and the art majors there, of course, take lots of art courses, but they also have to take lots of academics. Mm -hmm. And the result, you know, at an art school, you don't have like to take lots of academics, you know, you, you might only have possibly one, maybe two, possibly, you know, it, it was all studio courses and it was just working and producing and working and producing, which is, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. When you got your MFA, were you already thinking in the back of your mind, I want to teach or were you thinking, I'm going to find a, a gallery representation in New York. Like, what were, were you? Were you already sort of making a long-range plan, or, or like, what was you know between? So you graduate in '59, and then you're teaching in '64. Like, were, was there a plan for for the teaching piece? No. Um, when I when I graduated, I had no plan. <laughs> You know, it's like, well, what do you do next? You know, right. and because uh, my mind was filled with all those romantic ideas of uh, Bohemia, which is no one ever talks of, no, no one ever uses the word anymore. Yeah. Uh, the romantic idea of the uh, artist Garrett in yeah. Paris or whatever. Yeah. But I had no plan. Mm -hmm. And so I eventually, what I did is I, I moved to Boston. I got a job working nights. The idea was I was going to work at uh, work nights and do my work during the day. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't working. It wasn't working. And so at that particular time, there was still the draft. And so I, I knew at some point either I was either going to be volunteer for the draft or be drafted. And so I, I put my name in to be, you know, um, to go forward into the draft, mm -hmm. and which was in the long term was a good move for me because I ended up being stationed in Germany. And I was able to plan out my leave time to go to all the major capitals mm -hmm. and go to all the major museums, you know, I mean, I went, you know, to uh, the Tate in, in London and uh, the Academy and the Pitti Palace in Florence and Vatican Museum and uh, the Sistine Chapel. I mean, I just got to see all that stuff. And so after two years, I was like, I think I had more confidence in myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the other thing is that I think I lacked, when I graduated, I also lacked confidence. Mm -hmm. and, and so I gained enough confidence to apply and, um, since my, my whole background had been as a New Englander, <laughs> I decided like, I go to the other end of the continent and got into Mills College in Oakland, California, <laughs> which turned out again to be a very wonderful experience for me. <laughs> We're looking at images from your show in 2017. Um, this was actually two, two um, uh, bodies of work together, uh, 54 African Americans and homage to art. Um, and as you're speaking about this experience in the military and uh, going, just going to museums, um, which is something that I, I think is a very valuable experience for everyone. Um, it's almost, it almost sounds like that was a whole nother education, <laughs> you know? being in the presence of work, studying work, you know, um, and that is outside of a sort of formal education? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I like to think that I told every student I ever had, any art student I ever had, that the most important thing was to go and stand in front of the original work of art. Mm -hmm. There isn't a photograph or a digital image or a reproduction or in a book or any place else or a video or whatever that replaces the experience of standing in front of painting or sculpture or photograph or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, because you get the whole, you get the whole sensation. Mm 
yeah. of um, you can see how it was made. I mean, you know, like with some painting, you you see the paint, you see the texture. I mean, you you don't realize. I mean, when people stand there, they don't realize they're taking in all this information through the visual medium. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, one 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 story I have told many times is you know at one point in my career I was very enchanted with George O'Keefe. And I still am, by the way. And um, she was, this is years ago, I don't know, years ago, she was going to have a, maybe in the 70s, she was having a retrospective at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. And I was dying to see it. And I was particularly looking for one particular painting. And I went through all the galleries and I didn't see it. And I went around the galleries again. And then finally I spotted it and I was like, my heart sank because I thought the painting was, you know, like, you know, five feet in length or <laughs> whatever. And it wasn't, you know, it was only like, <clears throat> I don't know, about two and a half to three feet. And, and it was a narrow painting, it was very narrow. And it was like, oh my word, you know, and I, I had to, you know, pull myself together and you know, assess it for what it was, because it was really, it was, still is a marvelous painting, but that's the kind of experience that, you know, one needs to have, you know, to to really see it, yeah. uh, to really experience it, I should say, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you, so you head to New York in 1967 mm -hmm. uh, to establish yourself as an artist. Um, what was that like? Well, it was just, well, when I got there, it was 1967 and stuff had already been happening, you know, I mean, and stuff was continuing to happen. I mean, you know, there had been the breakthrough with the, uh, from abstract expressionism to uh, Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, well established at that point in time, which had been followed by, you know, Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein and then Don Judd in the middle of middle. I mean, things were just popping. I mean, they were just absolutely popping, you know. And um, it was just very exciting. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Yeah. You said that you um, you had exhibited at the Paula Cooper Gallery. That, yes. that was quite a quite an event. That that's yeah, like, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it was, it's jumping uh, in the 60s, and again, you're naming off all these uh, amazing. Uh, iconic artists uh, who were who were still working at the time. Oh uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It um, it inflated my ego, just to be very <laughs> simply. It inflated my ego, like you know, yeah. oh, you know, yeah. you know, you know, you know. I thought I was one of the guys, and it turns <laughs> out, it turns out, I wasn't one of the guys. <laughs> so who? So so who? Who were you? at that time or who Sorry? did you want to be who did, i said who who were you at that time but also like who did you want to be uh well i, I just want i guess i wanted to be known for my work you know i mean um i guess that's the, that's the only thing i can say you know i mean you know i wanted to be recognized i wanted to be known i wanted to mm -hmm. you know um <clears throat> I wasn't, I wasn't, I, you know, I wanted to do original work. I certainly didn't, I didn't want to do um, pastiches of other people's work and whatnot. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the, the work that I produced at that time was, if you looked at my work, you could say, well, it was a bit of this, a bit of this, a bit of this, a bit, you know, it was a, a compilation of like a lot of the so-called isms that were kicking around at that point in time. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking at a couple of close-ups here from uh, from your uh, work that you ex exhibited back in in 2017. Uh, do you do you want to talk a little bit about this collaging and the use of I think uh, some Bill Cunningham photographs in there? And sure. Well, um, I'm not sure where the genesis of the idea came from as such, you know, the, the real sort of spark that gave birth to it. I, um, when this was shown, it was, uh, the series was 54 African-Americans and since then 
after after the show, I found you know six other buried in my studio, so it's now sixty African Americans. Um, again, I I I, I, I sometimes I'm still searching for. I, I what do I say? I don't keep a journal and a diary, and so I don't recall when. Um, I got the genesis for the idea. It was basically that uh, I wanted to accumulate images of African Americans who had accomplished things in a host and variety of fields. Um, I get the New York Times uh, seven days a week, still do. And so uh, I also, wanted to use uh, African Americans who were not well known uh, or as well known as you. I mean, certainly in their different fields, they had made a name for themselves, but you know, there is um, sometimes popular athletic figures or uh, some others uh, become known. Mm -hmm. uh, like for instance, this one that's on the screen now with Misty, Misty Copeland. Uh, she wasn't, she's more well known today than, than she was at that time. But uh, so anyway, I started clipping, started clipping. So obviously, I don't know, I, I probably, I, maybe I started in 2, 211, 210 to 211, started clipping things out. Okay. And so then, um, I started on a standard size, and uh, I also started saying these uh, photographs from uh, Bill Cunningham. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Cunningham was a photographer th for the New York Times, and um, he, 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 I don't know if I'm not misspeaking, my recollection is that he spoke of himself as a fashion photographer. Some people called him a street photographer. And uh, he would go out on his bicycle in, in the city of New York and he would photograph people. And then he would accumulate, uh, you know, these photographs. And then um, I've forgotten if it was Saturday, I think it was Sunday. These were, you know, published in the Sunday New York Times. And um, so this, this uh, photographic collage of Cunningham was served as the backdrop upon which the African-American images were placed. And um, the idea was that the, uh, to show, it sort of visually shows that the African-Americans are, uh, are part of this a mass of humanity, but they also are apart from at the same time. You know, it's, a, it's, that, um, it's that problem of race in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this particular one of Misty Copeland, um, the, the white stripes across are, um, uh, is a ribbon, um, you know, which is, you know, it's like what she would use with her ballet, ballet shoes. Um, so, um, that, what would happen is that uh, almost all of them have, uh, or I shouldn't say all of them, but a majority of them have, you know, a physical thing added to them. Um, you know, I mean, that aspect of collage is you take something from the real world and insert it into the painting. And so it's no longer an illusion, like, a, like many paintings, like here, William, Greaves, not well-known gentleman who um, was a documentary film maker. And uh, as you can see, I uh, got a series of uh, 30, 30, millim 35 millimeter slides, which nobody knows. They don't, people don't even, I mean, younger people don't even know what they are. <laughs> I mean, what is that stuff? I mean, they don't even know what they are. And, um, you know, so I use that as a collage element here. And and one of the one of the uh, ways one of the other things that uh, um, where I got images like for instance uh, Mr. Greaves here 
is uh, from obituaries. Mm. You know, because when they when when there was obituary, it would point out that he was somebody who had done something, mm -hmm. and the general public. It was probably well known in the African American community, but in, in, the, in, in the in the wider uh, um, in the wider community, you know, he was not well known, and so a, a number of or a lot of the uh, of this uh, series is um, based on uh, come come from obituaries because then suddenly they they could be known. Um, here's uh, obviously James Baldwin, who is well known, well established, mm -hmm. a brilliant writer. I I I uh, I've never been able to get over his writing. He writes like a dream. I mean, his use of the English language is just, for me, breathtaking. And and what is. Um, what is always challenging for me is I can never quote him exactly. I feel like I'm really, you know, bastardizing his language because he speaks so eloquently and um, um, so beautifully. And and he just hits the nail on the head. I mean, he just go, he goes right to the point and he does it in such a, with grace and, and um, demeanor and, um, Anyway, I have, I'm a great admiration of his. Have you ever have you ever had a, a you know a, one of these uh, collages not work like you're you're where you've tried to like affix something or you're trying to get something to to uh, work with the canvas and it just didn't work. Um. Occasionally, I think, but I'm not 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 alone. I, it's, well, I'm just thinking back to you I know. Mean, they, I don't. They, yeah. See, because the, 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 yeah, one of the things that one of the things that I had set up for myself was that compositionally they're all the same. You know, mm -hmm. in the sense of Bill Cunningham in the background, an image on top of that, and some writing below. Okay, so yeah. so it's like, oh, that's the given. Yeah. So you just have to organize it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you know, in that sense, it's it, a lot of it's preconceived. A lot of it's preconceived. Well, I was amazed. I mean, when you did hang the fifty-four African Americans, which was on the small wall in the gallery in twenty seventeen, there was a lot of stuff coming off the canvas, and I always was in awe of like, how is all of that staying on the canvas? You, and there was one. I think you had like a statue. That was coming off the canvas. Yes, yes. Um, you know, it was like it was. I, I, I know which one that is. <laughs> yeah, I was like, how is that? Okay, well, there? well, the statue that came off the canvas you know, was <clears throat> a small reproduction of the Oscar, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it was, and the collage was of Sidney Poitier, who was the yeah, first yeah. black actor received an Oscar. Yeah, and the. The first time I showed uh, that uh, that uh, first time I showed uh, uh, forty African Americans, um, at the opening of a show, this couple came in, and they were visiting Amherst, and they were from Washington D.C. And the woman came up and approached me and asked me a couple of questions. She she shared with me that she was. A librarian mm. from uh, uh, from Washington D.C., and one of the things she did on a continuing basis was to have shows uh, in, in set up in the library for children, etc. You know, to expand their experience with books and images and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And she said. She told me that at one point in time, she did something with Sidney Poitier, however, whatever the display was. And these young kids came in and nobody knew who he was. Mm. Now, I mean, I mean, that was, I was not, I mean, I couldn't believe that. I mean, you know, to me, Sidney Poitier is just a given. I mean, it's not, 
you know, it's just a given and whatnot. And um, so, um, but anyway, that's that's my Sydney Portier story. This is this is an example of your other uh, series back in 2017, the homage to art. Can you talk a little bit about this decision to make this gray band on the bottom in all of these? <clears throat> well, first of all, just as again as a setup, the the compositional device is the same as for the African Americans. That is, the background is mm -hmm. uh, Bill Cunningham, and then a reproduction of um, sometimes a work of art, or in this case, Rembrandt, and um, and then there's this uh, uh, gray field below. And one of the things I attempted to do was, because <clears throat> the series is called Homage to Art. And um, I've forgotten how many there are. Um, There's a lot. <laughs> it, was, it, was it was end like, to end, know, end like, right? It was canvas to canvas. Yeah, they were right one, one right up against right another, next, yeah. OK? Yeah. Um, first of all, the idea was built, you know, on the idea like I'd been around art for a long time. I'd made a lot of art and seen a lot of art and whatnot. And I, you know, and it's really, you know, impacted my life and been part of my life. You know, as I, uh, as I like to say, you know, um, you know, the vicissitudes of life, you know, things happen up, down, back, forth, around and whatnot that impact you. But the one thing I always had was my art, regardless of what happened, I, you know, I could turn there. Um, so anyway, that was, a, I thought like, you know, I, I would just pay an homage to it by doing this series. And um, so anyway, um, the other point is, as I say, the name is generally on the bottom. And one of the things is I, I went on uh, Google and to uh, see if I could find the artist's name. And then I forged it <laughs> so that Rembrandt looks yeah. like Rembrandt's signature, uh -huh. OK? Yeah. And, um, and some, 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 some I could not find. But I tried to you know, forge this signature, the artist's signature. Yeah. Um, And, uh, and and uh, so I guess that's about it. It was just a, like a page to write on. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's take a look uh, at um, the latest show, which is actually up on the wall currently. Um, and I and I, you know, one of my questions was going to be about, you know, what role does literature play in your work? Uh, but I think you've already sort of alluded to that uh, when speaking about James Baldwin. But when you were working on the first series, did that really inform this third series, or how did how did this forty black writers evolve for you? Well, um, basically, when I started using um, images of African Americans, um, I started to be um, well, I don't know what the word is, aware, awake. Um, of other possibilities of bringing um, images of African Americans um, in my work and bring them forth. And I came across uh, uh, a postcard book of uh, writers, Afri uh, black writers. And um, so that I, I knew immediately that, that I wanted to do a series with that and uh, and also incorporate other writers that um, uh, I knew of or came across in terms of my reading and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as has already been shown in my other, the other, uh, again, it becomes a series. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the... Uh, once again, the preconceived idea uh, is uh, the format of um, an image, if possible, of the writer. And then uh, the, uh, a lot of times I would get a paperback copy of a book, mm -hmm. of, of a book, and then uh, use that 
uh, on the right. So the, the writer's on the left and the book is on, 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 on the right, okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, I used- uh, Your Google Home isn't set up yet. To get started, download the Google Home <laughs> app on a phone or tablet. Sorry about that. I don't know if you could hear that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the, the other thing I did was, um, uh, as you can see, I used uh, postage stamps. Mm -hmm. um, postage stamps of um, other African Americans, not just writers, but of African American writers. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I will. Yeah, one of the, one of the wonderful things about collage, it's re really related beautifully to the Google and to the internet, mm -hmm. because uh, you can go on and search. You know, for uh, oh, I think I want. I think I want postage stamps that have African Americans. You know, you can start checking around, in, yeah. and uh, you know, so uh, you know, I was able to accumulate, you know, lots of. Uh, um, so, and 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 the idea, conceptually, the idea is, of course, that these writers are part of the African American community and uh, past and present and. Um, and and so that's like I could bring you know bring the image together, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other aspect of it is that, um, you know, Maya Angelou is. If you ask people about black writers, they will probably tell you Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, you know, uh, who are well known as well they should be, okay. But then there are these others. I mean, if, if you asked about white writers, people would start, you know, could list probably 12 or 15 without hesitation, you know. And so it's also bringing for like, like the uh, 54 African Americans, so like bringing forward, um, you know, a host and a variety of, of writers who, uh, who can, can, you know, contributed to uh, literature, um and uh, to writing and uh you know to culture at large mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what was your decision with the line there's a line through each one um well first of all the line you know, like draws it right across okay that's you know but the other thing it does visually is it just nails it mm -hmm. you know you go from the line back Mm -hmm. And so it's very clear that this stuff is sitting on paper. It's not playing with an illu a spatial illusion. Right. You know, it just is really, you know, uh, I wasn't interested in, uh, like on this particular slide that's up now, for instance, on the right hand side, where you can see part of the photograph, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can see this. Uh, you know, you get the sense of space and illusion and whatnot, because the photograph can create that. <clears throat> but with the line, it helps just to flatten that out, and remind you that it's a photograph and it's not, we're not dealing with space or illusion in that way. Right, right. I mean, when we step back and you can see it sort of like it really brings the viewer across, you know, across and through the space, even from, from one piece to the next piece to the next piece as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that also happens when you light out that way. It also happens that way. And, 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 uh, and and quite frankly, the lines that don't all match up. You know, there there can be slight shifts in the, in the line, but yes, yeah, yeah. Um, we'll, we'll forgive you. That's okay. That's well, yeah. well, I should have <laughs> I should have thought of that sooner. You know. <laughs> well, you know, it sounds like these things evolved, though. I mean, you started some of this work, you know, in 2012, and you know, and that's nine years worth, and you know, so it sounds like things, um, you know, were not necessarily planned out entirely like oh this is what i'm going to be doing but but uh, you know and 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 you've already suggested you're adding to series that were you know not really finished but there's always additions to this work you know even now you probably could add even more writers you know i could but i'm not going to <laughs> <laughs> fair enough <laughs> so I, I, I want to ask you a little bit of a serious question. Um, you know, what impact has the pandemic had on, on your creative process? Um, 
oh, this is the end. This was the end. I'm sorry. This was the end with the list. Yeah, there is a list. The list of, of the oh. names associated yeah. with this particular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, yeah. I, it's a serious question, you know, like, like for some people, you know, uh, it means, you know, they can do more work for other people, they stop doing work. I'm just wondering, you know, how, how, how has it impacted your creative process? Well, uh, when I retired in um, December of 2019, I was looking forward to being able to work in my studio and um, I was originally scheduled to have a show in uh, this venue. And um, uh, I, have to, I have my, as an artist, I have my, fit, my feet in two worlds, okay? Now, all the work that we've been talking about and seeing today has to uh, most of it, uh, not maybe not. Well, I was uh, the homage to art series, maybe, but uh, but the other is, um, I would say, political social work in terms of you know, black writers and etc. Um, but I also do very abstract work. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I was working on. Um, building a body of work, ab abstract work, to show in this venue. And um, I had almost, you know, the body of work that I needed or wanted to show and whatnot. And, and it was somewhere in the cutting edge. Again, I, I don't keep a diary or a journal. Somewhere in the cutting edge of where I came to the end of that is also where the pandemic really kicked in. Mm -hmm. And um, which canceled my uh, ability to show in that venue. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I, as you know, I've been doing collages, you know, for a long time. And I have other collages that are, again, not political or social, but, uh, <clears throat> and so I, I just started uh, making, working on collages. And mm -hmm. um, I realized that it was, you know, it's tend to, in that way, it tend to be more intimate. You know, I could be alone in my upstairs, uh, uh, what I call my uh, office slash studio where I do my, my collage work. And, and I could just be there alone and quiet and, and, and do my work, okay? And so that allowed me to um, continue, continue to do like lots of collage, which I have since accumulated, you know, I, you know, I'm, for the I'm next just, show. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, you know, I, uh, yeah. I, I, I won't, uh, I won't, uh, uh, I'll, I'll send you an email about that, Sandra. <laughs> okay, okay. I have, uh, Keith, I have, I have um, one more question. Uh, for our time here, um, but you know, you're you're a spry uh, uh, person. Uh, you're one of the youngest 85 year olds I've ever met, um, and I I wonder what advice you would give to your younger self uh, now. What what would be the advice that you that you um, would give either to yourself, a younger artist as a younger artist, or that you might give to a young artist working today? Well, it's just to keep working. Mm. You know, I mean, I don't have any grandiose uh, advice. I mean, it's just you, you, you keep working, you know? I mean, um, try to go to the studio every day. Mm. There was, um, Um, I was divorced and I remarried. And uh, my wife, my, my present wife, um, became pregnant. And we had planned on it, by the way. It wasn't actually we planned on it. Um, 
And so then we had this, you know, this little boy growing up and um, I was finding it difficult to find time in the studio. You're like, why can't I have a day in the studio? Why can't I have eight hours? Why can't I, you know, you know, I was, you know, and I was feeling sorry for myself. <clears throat> so, uh, so then I made a bargain with myself. I said, um, go to the studio every day, regardless, yeah. for a year, and see what happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I started to do that. And at that time, I didn't, I, the garden shed hadn't been turned into a studio yet. So it was the upstairs back bedroom. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> so sometimes I'd go up there and something would happen. My wife, or, you know, at that time, Andrew was, you know, God knows, I don't know, five or six, I don't know. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I might be in there. And the only thing I could do was gesso a canvas, mm. you know, or I could just lay in a couple of colors or I could just do this or I could glue something down or whatnot, you know, cause I just, I couldn't get like three hours or five hours or whatnot. Mm. <clears throat> and um, out of 365 days, I think there was, I don't know, I think there were like maybe five days I didn't get to the studio at all, which I felt guilty about because I'd made this bargain with myself. Yeah. But after a year's time, I was surprised at how much work I had produced. Right, right, yeah. You know, because, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of times those, you know, five or 10 minutes of just doing something like just swing a canvas, the next time I went to the in there, I was ready for the next the next the next the next the next okay yeah i mean one of one of the one of the one of the one of the funny stories was that one day i <clears throat> one night i took my son up to and put him in the bathtub but then i went around you know to the room next door to my studio and i i took a step inside the studio and he called me <laughs> and so then i had to go back to the bathroom <laughs> and then I did, did debated myself. Well, does that really count? I mean, I didn't get any work done, but I was in the studio, you know. <clears throat> but I think, but but it's that in my history of you know over the years, there have been times when I was not working, mm -hmm. and if I stopped working, the longer I stopped working, the more difficult it was to mm -hmm. start up again. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, well, maybe, oh, maybe I'm not, maybe I shouldn't, maybe, you know, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, what, so, so by, by going, by, by attempting to go to the studio every day, it keeps the flow going within you, yep. which helps you to keep being productive. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, well, Keith, I, I want to thank you so much. For, for your time, for your sharing, for your honesty, for your work. Um, and uh, uh, you keep working as well. Well, thank you for the, the opportunity of letting me show my work at your gallery. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This has been a, an amazing experience. I hope uh, we can get more people in person, but uh, I have created a virtual tour uh, for those people who are not able to uh, come in person. So. You know, um, if you if you keep working, we'll keep showing. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. All right, all right, Keith. Um, well, I, that that ends our conversation today. I want to thank everyone for uh, uh, listening in, and um, I I hope that um, people are able to uh, enjoy Keith's work as much as I do. Thank you very much again, Keith. Take care. Yeah, you too. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.